Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of study. And um, we're going to continue looking at Daniel 11, 30 to 39, we've been going through. And um, lots of things we're learning. But before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for the light that you have shone upon our path and for the strength uh, to obey your word and to walk in the light. We pray for one another. We pray for the people in this movement. We pray for the truth, Lord, that, um, that we can represent it in all that we do and say. We ask, Lord, that we can minister to those around us and those that differ with us. We ask, Lord, that we can have a spirit of humility and that we can trust in your ability to work upon the hearts of others and that we can not try to do the work of the Holy Spirit, but that we can have the work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. We pray for your spirit then to be here this morning as we open your word. Help us to understand the things in Daniel chapter 11 that we can see clearly. Um, be with each person in this study, those who watch the video. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope uh, all of you had a good sleep, losing an hour of sleep with the, the time change here in North America. I know other people, they some people don't have time changes at all, which is preferable. And then when does your time change, Stephen? Yeah, normally it's the last weekend of March. Okay, so in a couple of weeks or whatever, you're going to have a time change. Okay, so um, now we were... Uh, does anybody remember specifically what we had? We were finishing off last week. What what had we done? Does anybody remember? We got I got I think we got up to verse thirty nine, and we were discussing um, the territories divided into dioceses for economic gain. And Stephen, you had brought up something about that. Can you remind us of what you said? You asked me. Yeah, because you brought that up that you said, you know, there was a way to understand that. We didn't change it in the in the paper. I think it was the, one of the last things we talked about. So we we didn't think diocese was was what it was referring to. OK, yeah. So I suggested that the dividing the land for gain. So mm -hmm. I took the example where you would have the king of England. Uh, during the time when England was Catholic, so in like the 12th, 13th centuries, and the, the, the Pope sort of uh, gave him the title of King of Ireland as well, uh, because Ireland wasn't really under the papal yeah. um, control so much, so in a sense that he's sort of uh, making this person, giving him that territory, so, so that the people say can gain mm -hmm. from that. Yeah. So, so how would we word that if we were going to put it in? Uh, you know, because I don't think it's about the diocese. It's not dividing the territories into diocese. It's, it's, it's more has to do with. It's a type of um, ecclesiastical conquest. Would that make more sense? Yeah. I also mentioned the Albigenses and the Cathars. Mm -hmm. The Pope could maybe say to some king who is loyal to him in France or part of Lombardy or somewhere that he mm -hmm. wanted him to go and, and uh, remove this territory and give out to him. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's a type of ecclesiastical conquest um, through, you know, if we're going to say it, ecclesiastical conquest through papal authority. Does that make sense? Or is there some better way to say it? Yeah. Assumed papal authority. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you need the word through in there too. Yeah. So that, that to me is more what it's talking about dividing the land for gain. That this is, uh, that the papacy is, you know, he has these false gods and rules over Christendom, but he's seeking to conquer all this other territory. Um, some's, some's Christian, some isn't necessarily. So anyway. I think that makes much more sense. 
Now, um, now we had looked at, you know, the, the number 4242 for the word gain and seen there that the two periods of 42 months, which, which I thought was interesting. Now it happens at the time to be, you know, footnote number 30, you know, so that, that's, that represents a month as well, but that, that'll change as I edit the paper. <laughs> so I think, I think, you know, we went through this. Let's just go over it again. So this is taking Swearingen's, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, outline, I guess, paraphrase, something like that of these verses. And we went through and edited them. So, so this is still just the historic application. And, um, you know, we, we go back to verse 29, where we talked about the time appointed. And we're saying that that time appointed is pointing to November 9th, 1989. And, and that's, that's going to be Daniel 11, verse 40b, right? So that is Daniel 11, 29 is addressing Daniel 11, verse 40b. And, and it's comparing that to these other histories. That's going to be the fall of Egypt and the fall of Western Rome. That, that it's like those, but it's different in some other way. And the way in which it is different has to do, that's what one of the things we haven't, haven't addressed. And so when it talks about the fall of, of Western Rome, though, it's going to say in which uh, the ships of Kittim, of the Germanic tribal invasion shall come against him, Western Rome. Therefore, he shall be grieved and returned and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So in Swearingen's, he's going to have this. I can't remember exactly what he did, but it was different. So we're saying anyway, this indignation against the Holy Covenant is going to be paganism, the 1260 for paganism. So it's it's saying that, that that's happening under uh, pagan Rome, right? And in ha have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. That's apostate Christianity. So we're going to see that that brings us from the fall of Rome to Clovis's baptism in 508 on December 25th, where arms shall stand on his part. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. That it is, this is paganism sanctuary, not God's sanctuary. And shall take away the daily, that is, remove paganism, and shall place or give the abomination that make it desolate. So they set up the papacy in power over the church and state and the conscience of Christians in 538. And such as do wickedly against the covenant. So this covenant here is obviously the, the true everlasting covenant. But those who turn against the gospel through recantation. Uh, he, the papacy, spiritual king of the north. Uh, shall he, the papacy king, king of, spiritual king of the north, corrupt by flatteries, flatter with prospects of position and material gain. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do. And, and that is, they're going to be faithful followers of God, will remain faithful, preach the truth, and win many true converts. So we can accept that idea. And they that understand among the people, that is, the faithful Christians, shall instruct many. That is spread the light of truth, yet they, the faithful, shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, by spoil. Many days. So the many days there we're going to refer to the per papal persecution, 538 to 1798. Now, when they shall fa fall, they shall be holpen with a little help. So we looked at Revelation 12, verse 16, where it talks about the earth helping the woman. Right. So that's going to be. Um, the wilderness, the United States, and also, you know, in a sense, the mountains of uh, of uh, Europe, where we have uh, the different uh, Sabbath keeping groups or true Christians. Uh, but many shall cleave uh, to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white. So what we're saying is this brings us to the end of the papal period and it's going to introduce the three angels message to try them to purge them to make them white and uh, we also can recognize then that that's going to be uh, a parallel so i should need to do this here i just want to put the reference here to daniel chapter 12 uh, which verse is it 
verse 10? Yeah, verse 10. So Daniel 12, verse 10. Already changing our footnote number there. Okay, so in Daniel 12, verse 10, and then even, now it says to the time of the end, but we say that that uh, uh, prefix to the word is can be translated as at, so even at the time of the end. So this is going to bring us 1798 again, because it is yet for an appointed time. And the appointed time I mark as the 10th day of the seventh month, the Moed, or the time appointed, it says. So that is, um, I'll put it in here. I don't want it capitalized. So October 22, 1844. And then the king, that is Papal Rome, the king of the north, shall do according to his will. And this is a marker as with Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. We see that them doing according to their will is a characteristic of these kingdoms of Bible prophecy. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. So we're saying this is describing the papacy, the man of sin, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and the Great Controversy chapter 3. And shall prosper till the indignation, the 1260 years of papal per per persecution, be accomplished in 1798. Uh, for that that is determined shall be done. And we're saying that, that that is determined is referring to the 45 years of between the end of the 1290 and the 1335. And again, that um, obviously that's going to be Daniel 12. So I should probably put a footnote there. Even though most people are going to know what that is. So that's going to be uh, 12 verse 11 and 12. So you can see how this this so closely aligns with Daniel chapter 12, how it's 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 going through that history. It's going all the way from well Daniel 11, verse 40, and then bringing you through uh, Daniel chapter 12 in in its references. OK, so I probably should have put this footnote over here. I don't know why I put it there. There we go. OK, so neither he, the pit. Uh, papal Rome, neither shall he, papal Rome, regard the God of his fathers, a true God, nor the desire of women, the celibacy of Catholic clergy, clergy, nor regard any God. He shall magnify himself above all so that he has supreme religious authority. But in his estate, that is his position, shall he honor the God, and we change the capital that's there in the King James to the lowercase, because this is not referring to the true God, the God of fortresses. So this has to do with um, supreme civil authority. That's what we're saying. This, um, so we got supreme religious authority and supreme civil authority. So the Pope has both of these. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. So this refers to the idolatrous worship. And thus shall he do in the most strongholds. Now I said from the Vatican and, and probably any of the, the churches of, of Catholicism with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he, that is the papal power shall cause them false gods to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. So the Ecclesias, so that's Christendom. And then we have this ecclesiastical conquest through assumed papal authority. So are people happy with this, with the with the historical application of how we have taken these verses? Does this, this make sense? Any questions, any comments? It would look and seem to be logical. Yeah, and, and, and the thing that I like about it is that it actually is is connected with chapter twelve, right? That in a sense, chapter 12 is giving a summary of this. Does that make sense? Basically, once we get to verse 40, it's it's going to give a summary of this to some degree. Okay. So I'm just looking up something here, but one of these words doesn't make sense to me. So so anyway, what, what we have here is we have uh, things that we've seen in these verses that refer to Daniel 11, verse 40 both A and B, so the whole verse, the time of the end and, you know, October 22nd, the appointed time. 
but also the time at the end in in our time and the appoint, appointed time, which would be uh, the end of the prophetic periods, or not the end, the end of the Day of Atonement. Um, now, I was just looking at at one of these words in verse 32, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, those who turn against the gospel through recantation. Now, we have this word against. Now, often we have things that are against, right? We, we see the word against quite a bit in the, the scriptures in Daniel chapter 11. But this word against, 7561, it is a, now I'm just trying to see, they do wickedly against, I guess, is what it says. So against is, I'm trying to see how this is structured. So I think it's just a lament in front of the word. No, it's actually, so this form of this word is just what I'm kind of concerned about. Now, now the word wickedness here is, is the number. So 7561 is the word wickedness, rasha, to be wicked. And then I'm looking at the form of this word. So it is, um, it's got a vav consecutive at the beginning. And then it's going to have a mem in front of rash, rasha. And it's going to have the masculine uh, singular. So that's what I'm trying to figure this out. Sorry about this. I should have looked at this. And it says, such as do wickedly against the covenant. But it looks like it should be he. So I'm just going to look this up in this other one. So this word, if I parse it, it's it's the hifil ah. So it's a hifil participle. Now, that doesn't mean anything to any of you guys. Uh, but it's just, it's a type of verb. So I'll show you here. I'm not always good at these uh, different um, verbs in the different forms, but it says it's a hiffle. It means to condemn as guilty or to act wickedly. So that, that's, that's, so it's not to be wicked, which would be the call form of the verb or to be guilty or be condemned. So it can be to condemn as guilty or or to act wickedly. So we have these different forms of this word. And then, so I'm not sure why it's such as do wickedly. I'm trying to figure out why the King James would translate it that way. I'm going to look at comparing these. So here with the ESORT, I can look at a bunch of different translations and see how they translate it. Those that do evil against the agreement, such as uh, as wickedly break the covenant, the transgressors shall bring about a covenant by deceitful ways. That's a bad translation. That's Brenton. Some translations that I like in here, well, the English uh, standard version is pretty good. He shall seduce by flattery those that violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. So I, I like this idea, um, such as wickedly break the covenant is to Geneva. Um, such as wickedly break the covenant, that's Bishop's Bible. By deceit, the king will win support. The Jewish Publication Society says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupted by blandishments. Instead of flatteries, but same thing. And with flatteries, he shall cause to sin those that violate the covenant. That's uh, the Jubilee Bible. King James Version, such as do wickedly. I'm just not quite sure exactly how to understand that sentence. So, so I apologize a little bit. Now, one of the, the reason why it actually costs, uh, it attracts my attention is the Hebrew number. So what do you see in that Hebrew number? Anybody recognize something? 7561? What if, what if we had the number 7651? If we switch the two numbers around, what, what Hebrew number would we have? What, what word would that be? 7651 instead of 7561. So if we had a different uh, order of those numbers, what word would that be? 7651, anybody know? That would be the, the word in Leviticus 26 that's translated as seven or seven times. So I wonder here, could this be a reference? Because we know this is, is dealing with 538. Now, do we have a Sunday law typified in at the beginning of the 1260? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. So, and, and how do we, how do we say that? Why, how can we say there's a Sunday law typified at the beginning of the 1260? That's the Council of Orleans. Okay. And so can you explain that to people? So there was a council in the city of Orléans, yeah. France. Yeah. And they made a Sunday law. Okay. So, so it's an actual Sunday law? Yes. And uh, Orléans yeah. is named after Aurelian, the emperor. In 274, okay. the 25th of December, uh, made a temple, dedicated the Temple of Sol Invictus in Rome. Okay. So you have so, that there in son son relation to Aurelian, which can connect to Orleans. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's pretty interesting. So, so making this, uh, doing again, uh, wickedly against the covenant, right? I mean, it's more than, so we, what we have to say here is that there, there, this typifies a Sunday law. And the fact that we have this Hebrew number that is a different order of the word seven, which of course can refer to the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. So I, I'm going to put a footnote there just because I don't want to forget about it. So it's called the council. Okay. First thing I guess what I should do is I should put seven, five, six, one. So another thing of interest is it's, uh, that was 264 years after that dedication. Okay. How do you spell the word seven? Why is this telling me it's spelled wrong? Isn't seven S- spelled? S-E-V-E-M. Yeah, why is it telling me it's spelled wrong? <laughs> That's odd. So. Yeah, and the options that it gives you to replace it are not correct either for, for what we're talking about. It must have, I must have another language. I have, I don't know. Anyway, there must be another language. I must have changed the language or something. I don't know what I did. Okay. So, so I got to put this in here, what Stephen's talking about. So we have the council, how do you spell council of, of Orleans? Is that how you spell Orleans? Yeah, it looks okay. Okay, you got the Council of Orleans in 274? No, no, 538. Oh, in 538, right. But it's going to refer to... Um, and so Orlean was near, uh, Orleans is named after Aurelian. Okay. So it was a city that he kind of named after himself. Okay. So okay. Orleans is named... After or now it's a you think saying how do you spell Aurelian? I think it's a u r l e. I think a m a m. Okay. Have to check it. Okay. Well, there it is. Okay. So Aurelian. So he's named after Aurelian, the, the city of Orleans, and uh, sorry, a. U R L I E M A U A U R E A U R E L I A N. Okay, that's what I got there. Okay, so it's named after Aurelian, and and what what do we say about Aurelian? Because you had two seventy four of them. Yeah, so he set up the he dedicated the um, temple of Sol Invictus, the sun god, the invincible sun. In 264 AD, in uh, I think it's in Rome. And that was on the 25th of December. Okay, so the 25th of December, and you're saying that it's going to be 264 years to 538? No. Yes. So wasn't it 274? Yes. So just 264 years, but it's 274. Uh, I'm going to put here on AD. December 25th, 274 AD, 264 years prior to 538 AD. Okay. Well, it actually says it's the third council of Orleans. It takes place and prohibits rural labor on Sunday. So it says it was a synod of the Catholic bishops of France. It opened on the 7th of May, 538. 
Okay, so it's the third Council of Orleans in 538, and which date in May? It opened around, it says around, so maybe not exactly, but uh, 7th of May. Around the 7th of May. I'll, I'll just leave it as 538. Okay, so, so we have Aurelian, and he dedicated the Temple of Sol Invictus on December 25th, 274 AD, 264 years prior to 538 AD. So what we can say there is that we have uh, this symbol of Sunday law. I'll put this here. It typifies a Sunday law. All right. So we've got that typifying the Sunday law, and then we have this third council of Orleans. Okay. So so I think this, you know, this just looking at that one little, you know, number uh, draws our attention to this. Right. So that was looking at that that Hebrew number. 7561. So the covenant, uh, obviously, that is the Beret, the covenant, you know, often referred to as like, this is the true covenant, right? Okay. So, so I think it's all logical. I don't, I don't, personally, I don't see any problems. We've worked through it. So what we're saying is that all of this here, when it starts dealing with the papacy, it's going to cover that, that transition from pagan to papal Rome. Um, it's first going to deal with the fall of pagan Rome and how that leads to what happens in the sixth century. And then it's going to address the end of the 1260, the time of the end in Daniel 11, verse 40, A, and the time of the end in Daniel 11, verse 40, B. So all of those things are here in these these verses. So when we get to Daniel 11, verse 40, it's not like this is all of a sudden introducing the time of the end. It's it's sort of addressing those two times of the ends, comparing them to these battles between the king of the north and the king of the south. So we have a time of the end where the king of the south comes against the king of the north, and then we have a time of the end where the king of the north comes against the king of the south. And in the first one, that's going to be in 1798. The king of the south being France, coming against the papacy. It's going to have this. Um, now, there's some things. That, so I said we weren't going to look at verse 40 and that. But but I think we should we can should continue on with these last verses of Daniel chapter 11 as far as the the present truth application. So one of the things um, we can see here that that Swearingen has a similar view to this movement. Right? Similar, it's not the same. That is, they don't. He doesn't mark the time of the end in 1989, but he does see a Daniel 11 verse 40b as being fulfilled uh, in 1989. He, you know, he he has studied um, Lewis F. Weir, so so he he marks some of the same things that we do. But there are some differences. Now, would we say that the wound was healed, the papal Rome in its healed wound after uh, 1929? Do we do we see the wound healed in 1929? Would we agree with that? No. No. And why not? Well, it hasn't conquered three geographical areas. Okay. Right. It so, hasn't the authority over the the kings of the earth to demand the heretics, the, the killing of heretics. Mm-hmm. So, so when do we mark the wound as being healed? Is that still future? I guess I'm asking. Yes, I'd say the Sunday law. Right. So we're going to say it's at the Sunday law. So, so we're just going to say the king of the north. Now they say papal Rome, but we would say that this is the papacy with the USA. So the King of the North is not just the papacy, but it's the papacy with the USA. Now they're going to use the Americans, of course, you know, American military pressure, American economic pressure. um, And we would agree that entering into the countries refers to the former Soviet bloc nations and shall overflow and pass over, destroy the Soviet Union by the end of 1991. So, so we would agree with it there. We just didn't agree with uh, the deadly wound being healed. 
and I and I don't have the Hebrew numbers in here yet, so I didn't put those in, <clears throat> which I need to. Um, so if we're going to look at the time at the end, so I'm going to put these Hebrew numbers in. Okay, so we got that word time that we've seen many times, and then the same with end. We we'll just put this in here. It's going to be Ketz. So the King of the South four four two eight, and South is five zero four five. Now this word uh, push five zero five five, or <laughs> did I, did I, I typed the wrong number in five zero five five. So we got the word uh, south is Negev. That's the desert south of of um, of Jerusalem, which you know becomes a symbol for the word south, right? And this push is Negach to push thrust gore. Right, so this is, and what's the significance of why do we have this word push here? And we have we'll that up. in Daniel chapter eight as well. Yeah. Okay. So what's so the significance? Like a, yeah, it's like a violent action. Uh, yeah, um, a violent action. Yeah. No, so it's one of their arguments that it's not applying to to Egypt. You know, right. you can't really compare it to what it did. You no, know, Greece did to. We did Persia to what Egypt did to France in 1798. Right. Yeah. Because they're going to say that the him is going to be France and it's going to be Egypt pushing against France. But, but France is really the, even in the situation with Egypt, it's going to be the, the instigator, right? Like France is like, Egypt is not coming against France. It's not, it's not, it's not conquering France in any way. Right? That's the idea. Yeah. France is coming, going into Egypt. And... Yeah. Right. So, so you can't use this push as sort of a, a defensive posture. This is an aggressive posture. Right. I would agree. Yes. Yeah, okay. So he's going to push at him war against the papacy. And then the king of the north of the papacy with the USA shall come against him. Now, one of the things about this, I mean, to me, just the very obvious thing, we have these battles between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. And now in this interpretation that Uriah Smith and, and Alexander Keith and, and Josiah Litch use, this is, they have it not as a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, right? Yes. So. Now we, we look at this as two, two different battles. The king of the south defeating the king of the north and then the king of the north defeating the king of the south. And that's consistent with what we see with the north and the south. To have some other power that the north and the south are coming against would be inconsistent with what has happened before. Yeah, so anyway, it says much of this prophecy will be repeated. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have that um, within the previous verses in Daniel 11. It's just north versus south. It's not north versus this other power and then south versus this other power. So in a sense, none mm-hmm. of that there, north, south, uh, will be repeated, really, mm-hmm. in verses 11 or chapter yeah. 11. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it would not make sense. And, I mean, this makes perfect sense. What, what we see, especially what we see in the other ones where it's going to talk about the time of the end and it, and it's really pointing to the time of the end in 1798. And then it's going to talk about the time of the end again, pointing to the time of the end in 1989. So this is much more consistent. So this pushing, you know, would, would be consistent with that as well. Now the king of the north. So again, we're going to have, um, this word, I might as well just copy this. It's going to be the same. Um, and the king of the north, north is um, 6828. Now, just, you know, I, I'm still kind of amazed that um, when I add these numbers, 4428, uh, 5045, and 4428, and 6828, you add them together. You're going to get the number of days from my birthday to November 9th, uh, 2019. And, and I, I don't think that's a coincidence. 
I think that's that's very interesting that the king, king of the north, king of the south, gives us. I can't remember the number. It's uh, what is it? So four four two eight times two plus five zero four five plus six eight two eight. Yeah, so twenty thousand seven hundred and twenty nine days. So from the end of my birthday, the day I was born, to the beginning of November 9th, 2019, uh, that King of the North, King of the South symbol comes to that date. And and I think that would relate to the discovering of the 391 and a half days from October 13th at noon to the beginning of November 9th, 2019 as well. So these these connections, I think, are important. So and then it's going to have uh, the the king of the north shall come against him. So this is going to be um, says shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now, there's two different numbers there, uh, eight, one, seven, five and five, nine, two, one that they're going to uh, put here. So I'm just going to type them in. H eight, one, seven, five. And H five nine two one. Now I'm not sure why they they put those there. Why they didn't put? Uh, because when you look at these Hebrew numbers, so this is just the way they do it in on the E sword. So they're going to have Sa'ar, which is the eight one seven five, and that refers to a storm, a tempestuous whirlwind, and then the word Al. So that word Al is just um, a preposition. So they could have put that 5921 after the word against. They shall come against. They could have put the 5921 there, I would think. And him like a whirlwind. Now we know, of course, the whirlwind, the days of the whirlwind, that's it's either Newsweek or Time magazine or something where they're gonna a, a couple of years later um, write an article dealing with the fact of of what had happened prior to the fall of the Soviet Union with Reagan and John Paul II, right? Am I correct in my memory? I think that Newsweek article is on December 1989. Okay, the Newsweek is is an earlier one. But yes. that, which, one, which one says the days of the whirlwind? Yes, yeah, so that's the Newsweek. Okay, so that's going to be... In 1989? Yeah, hang it December. Yeah, I should get these things straight in my head. Yeah, I think I was thinking of the Holy Alliance one, which is a Time Magazine article, and that's going to be later. Yeah, that's going to be 30 years prior to the Ukraine war, so that would be the 22nd of February, 1992. But they put out that issue? Yes. Okay, so... 20, 27th of February, 1992, you're saying? No, 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 22nd of February. 22nd of February, okay. Trying to find, I can't seem to find the cover for that one. There's a Newsweek People of the Year in 1989, but I don't see the... Anyway, I need to find that. <clears throat> anyway, the Days of the Whirlwind. Days yeah, I don't think it's actually on the cover. But it's, it's actually, uh, when you actually go into the contents. Oh. It'll be one of the, the titles of one of the pages. So it's ah, maybe the. Yeah, it is. So this is. Okay. Are you talking about the holy, uh, holy, um. No. We're talking about the days of the whirlwind. Oh, okay. I thought you was talking about that book, that magazine. Excuse me. Nope. Time magazine. Well, we're talking about uh, the days of the whirlwind. So I got, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, so days of the whirlwind. Yeah, so they're going to, in that article, they're going to talk about the progression of events from Budapest to East Berlin, 1989, a year beyond all imagination. By autumn, the crumbling of the communist bloc had a momentum of its own. So, so they're listing out all days um, and the different dates. Okay. Yeah, so it's on the, t- the 25th of December 1989. So it's on page 26. It's, uh, it talks about the Eastern European Journal of Events in 1989 that helped crumble the, the communist bloc. 
Okay. So how is yeah. this going to be snow padding? Yeah, so it's actually published on December 25th, 1989. Yes. That's the date of the article. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I want to get. I just want to get this in the footnotes. Again, I'm just going to put this as a footnote. I can cut and paste it here for you. Chat. This is easier. What's that? Okay. Yeah, I can cut, you can cut and paste it. Okay. I'll do that. Thanks, Stephen. So we've got the days of the whirlwind in there. And we can definitely, well, uh, mark that. So then we're going to have the three geographical locations, right? That's what it's, it's going to be shown here. So you're going to have, uh, so the Soviet Union is one of the geographical locations, correct? Yes. Okay. And then we're going to have the United States is another one. Mm -hmm. And then the third one? The world or Egypt? Egypt, right. So, so here, um, so why are we saying that Egypt is, so it's the former Soviet countries remaining communist countries or how do we, because, because, you know, the king of the south is the Soviet Union. Usually that would be associated with Egypt. But how are we, how are we differentiating them? Well, the Bible makes a difference between the king of the south and Egypt. Okay. And where do we find that? Verse, uh, if you just compare verse 40 and verse 42. Okay, so just by looking at, um, so when we say Egypt, and he has here, well, let's let's go through verse 41. Okay, so first, he papal Rome shall enter into the glorious land of the United States, and many shall be overthrown, right? That is, countries is an added word, correct? So I just I just usually like to do this with yes. added words um, that we don't need. Just cross them out. Many shall be overthrown. Many individuals. So I'm going to take out countries. Now, is this, so we would look at this as dealing with the Sunday law, right? That's what we understand here. But when he enters into the glorious land, is that addressing specifically the Sunday law? That's what we're saying? Because that's how Swearingen's looking at it. Yes, well, that's what Jeff also spoke. Yeah. So this is the way I would understand it. Now, um, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So he has this as spiritual Babylonians, members of non-Christian heathen religions and worldly people who exit all apostate religions. But these shall escape out of his hand. Now, how do we understand Edom, Moab, and Ammon? Apostate Protestantism. Yeah, so we would actually look at apostate Protestants. Now, why? Why do we do that? And not not the non-Christian religions. Well, they were like connected to Judea closely in a sense. Like Edom was from Esau, so that's like Isaac's brother. Yeah, they're relatives. Judea, right? we would connect with the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. So these were like close to us in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So so these these are. Our relatives. Now, now Ammon. What, what, I know. I know Edom and Moab. What? What's Ammon again? I was getting yeah, confused. So, that's, uh, so Moab and Ammon were the sons of Lot. Right. Right. Sons of Lot. Okay. Okay. So, so that's why we say these are apostate Protestants who recognize the man of sin. Is the way that I would see it. That is, there are going to be many pro pro Protestants. Some already keep Sabbath. But as they see the actions of Sunday legislation, they will come to stand on the side of the Sabbath. So then it says, he, papal Rome, shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries. Now, in this case, I would mark this as the UN. Would we agree with that? Yeah, it's just the other nations of the world. Yeah. And the land of Egypt. So Egypt is the world. So it's just kind of a, a reiteration of it. The world shall not escape. That is, they shall submit to Sunday legislation. But he, papal Rome, shall have power over the treasures of gold, of silver, and over all the precious things, the spiritual and material wealth of Egypt. So, we would just say the world. 
Now, the Libyans and Ethiopians are the Islamic nations of the world. We have this rich and poor or right? Libyans referring to the rich and, and Ethiopians to the poor. I think the FRB the other way around. The other way around? So the FRB the Ethiopians. You could, be right. you could be right. I was trying to think if that was right or not. I guess, you know, I had a 50-50 chance. Sure that's correct? Libya is the poor country. Ethiopia is the rich one. That was what Jeff was arguing anyway. The magazine came okay. around. Now, being at his steps, now I didn't put all the Hebrew words in here yet, which uh, I will. Um, but being at his steps, he's going to have this that they will submit, eventually submit, companionship. So that's 4703. So that's really companionship. So companionship with Rome. So the rich and the poor. That's that's how we understand it. Whether that's the best symbol for Libyans and Ethiopians, I don't know, but that's how we've understood it. <clears throat> now, tidings out of the east and out of the north. Now, uh, Swearingen, his book is titled Tidings Out of the Northeast. But, but you know, we, we have here the east and the out of the north is two different directions. Now, he says that this is the message of Seventh-day Adventism, the loud cry of the three angels' messages. Is it the loud cry of the three angels' messages or the loud cry of the third angel? And so we're going to have to understand why east and north. I mean, we know why, but we need to make that clear. I'm going to put these uh, words in here, 8052. So, so let's have a discussion about these directions. So east and out of the north. So why out of the north? Let's ask that first. So this north is obviously from the true king of the north. And normally from the north comes destruction, right? The armies of Assyria and Babylon and so forth. But this is tidings, and this tidings would be news, right? That's all tidings is. It's an announcement, a doctrine, news, news report, rumors. Out of the east, that is the sunrise. So normally what do we connect this to? The east part. So let's look at the east. What do we connect the east to? Normally the Islam. Okay. But in this case, it's going to be who comes from the east? Christ. Christ comes from the east, right? And does Christ also come from the north? Yes. If we have the east, okay. So what is the north? And that's the message of the king of the north, the true king of the north. So how do we tie this symbolically? So we got we got two messages, not one, right? We're swearing in just tries to put it into one, but there there are two messages here. One is out of the east, and one is out of the north. So the message out of the north is different than the message out of the east. So where do we associate the north, the sides of the north? So this is the message of. We have sides in the north. I think it's in Psalm 46. Mm -hmm. Mounted congregation on the sides of the north. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. The city Psalm 46. Of the great... Yeah. So, so we have, and, and Satan seeks to usurp Christ's throne on the side of the north. So would this message of, of, of the north have to do with the close of probation? We also have two messages in Revelation 13. You have the mighty angel, come out, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and come out of her, my people. Two messages. Okay, okay. so so one is we can uh, we can say that, that the north associates with the message of Babylon. So maybe what we could say, so coming out of the east, the message is of, of this. How about um, that message is, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And the message out of the north is, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Is that that better? I don't need to count. It's fallen. So that's that's the second angel's message in the loud cry, right? Because it's the second angel's message is is a twofold message. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And Babylon is fallen, is fallen, come out of her, my people. Does that make sense then? The east and the north representing those. Christ comes from the east. 
and the message of the north is the message of Babylon. Are people happy with that? Well, would it be exempting then Islam? Oh yeah, we're exempting Islam. The tidings of the east have nothing to do with Islam. Uh, this is an argument of um, Louis F. Weir's. When it talks about the king, that the way of the kings of the east might um, be prepared in in um, dealing with the drying up of the river Euphrates in Revelation 16, 13, I know. Yeah, yeah, so 12, uh, Revelation 16, 12. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, been discussing with people on Facebook, you know, they, they're saying the drying up of the river Euphrates, that's, you know, going to happen before the close of probation. And, you know, they're talking about the actual river Euphrates. And, of course, the ways of the kings of the east, that's going to be Islam, right? That's the way they would look at this. But but Louis F. Weir shows that this is actually a re- reference to Christ's second coming. And that this drying up of the river Euphrates is the coming of the fall of Babylon, the destruction of Babylon. And, and this is, of course, the sixth plague, right? And so we're not going to take this any of this literally. Where there's not going to be three unclean spirits that look like frogs coming out of the mouth of some dragon or some beast or some false prophet, right? These are symbols. And if you want to understand this, you read the time of trouble in the great controversy. So well, these here kings would be Darius and Cyrus in the right. Type. Yeah. right. So, so in the type, they're types of Christ. Right. Yes, but then would you not maybe sort of see a sort of connection with Reagan and Bush? No, no. I mean, I mean, this is the sixth so, play, right? You know, from the time of the end to the end of time. Okay, so you're sense. saying, so you're saying that, but you're going to try. Way, I don't way, know. If uh, I, I know. I know what you're saying, but that that's rather difficult. I mean, yeah. So. You could say that Reagan and Bush uh, typify the second coming of Christ, just as Cyrus and Darius do. In the sense, maybe not even typifying it, but kind of like the uh, beginning of the end, typifying the end. I don't know. But that would be typifying. That would still be typifying because the end typifies, the beginning typifies the end. Right. It's not it's not the end. I mean, it's it's typifying what's going to happen at the end. God declares the end from the beginning. Right. So you got the beginning there where you have Darius and Cyrus. Right. They're going to typify. The deliverance from Babylonian captivity, which typifies what happens at the end, but also, yes, Reagan and Bush would typify that as well. But they wouldn't be the actual end. So it's a typification if it's not the actual. But it begins that, right, that whole line. I see what you're saying. But here, the way of the kings of the east, this this is referring back to the fall of Babylon on October 13th, 539 B.C., right? So they we know that Cyrus is a type of Christ. He's the Lord's anointed. He's the Messiah. And so this is... This is using this illustration from that story to show the coming of Christ. So my my the reason why we're looking at this is, of course, in Daniel chapter 11, when we're dealing with tidings out of the east. So that has to be referring to these messages that are going to trouble the papacy. So with uh, Cyrus and Darius, that's happening at the end of the 70 years for for Babylon, with yeah. Reagan and Bush, maybe you can see the 777 days there, and then yeah. with Christ at the end, it's maybe connecting to the seventh day Sabbath, the end of um, yeah. So there, there is lots. Of the yeah, so there is lots of connections we can make. Beginning of the seventh millennium. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because there's there's lots of things that tie together here, but I think in the simplest form. If we look at the tidings of the East as referring to the message, because this is the second angel's message. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and Babylon has fallen, has fallen. 
because it's going to it's it's that message, the message of Revelation 18, that is going to join with the third angel and it swells into a loud cry. Are you okay with that, Stephen? I mean, I know all these other connections are there. Yeah, I'm okay, but um, <laughs> hard to know exactly for sure what the east and the north is, but it could be that. Well, well, it it has to be this. I mean, it can be other things because they're tied to it. But in the simplest form, if we're going to take this this as the gospel, because the tidings is going to be the gospel proclamation, right? Yes. Because these tidings then are the loud cry of the third angel. Um, so I'd do it that way. And it's going to be joined by, right, the tidings themselves are is the good news. It's the everlasting gospel, loud cry of the third angel, joined by, I'll put joined, and I'll just leave that, joined out of the east by the message of behold, the bridegroom cometh, and Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So those two messages are joining with the everlasting gospel, which is going to give us the loud cry. That's how I would do it. Now, what about um, shall trouble him? I don't like the idea that it's hindering the work of the papacy because this troubling is uh, is more fear. Would not be more making angry. No, anxious, afraid. I'm just gonna put the Hebrew number in here. Nine two six. That's the idea there. Um, then we have, therefore, he shall go forth. Which is three, three, one, eight. That's just a common Hebrew word. It's, uh, it's, it can be to go, to, to bring out, if it's causatively, all kinds of different things that it means. Like when the Israelites, you know, go forth out of the land of Egypt, same idea. Um, so he's going to go forth uh, with great fury. That's probably Gadol. Yeah. One, four, one, nine. And fury. Two, five, two, three. So he goes forth with great fury. Obviously, that's just anger and to destroy. Now, this utterly to make away many. I'm just going to look at this here in Hebrew. Just how they got utterly to make away. That's a strange uh, word. So, so the word itself Karam, that's translated, and to utterly make a way, and then Rabim is going to be the many, 7227, but to utterly make a way. The word means uh, to ban, devote, destroy, utterly, completely destroy, dedicate for destruction, exterminate. Um, in the Hifel form means to prohibit, ban, consecrate, devote, dedicate for destruction, Exterminate, completely destroy in the hopeful form, to be put under the ban, be devoted to destruction. And there's, uh, it also can mean to split or slit or mutilate part of the body. And there's the call form to mutilate and the hifl to divide. So this word in this form, it's in the hifl infinitive construction. So that would be, so here it's, it's, um, so it could mean to prohibit uh, to consecrate, devote, dedicate for destruction, exterminate completely or destroy. But could this possibly be referring to uh, the restrictions that come with the Sunday law? They're not able to buy or sell. Because I, I wouldn't put cast faithful Sabbath keepers into great tribulation. I don't think that's what it's referring to. With the uh, prohibition to buy and sell. Yeah, I would say it's the prohib- prohibition to buy and sell. That's what I would do. That's more what the word to make away means, totally make away. I'm just going to put that word there. Right, so the many would refer to the Sabbath keepers. Okay, um, our time's up for today. So we'll come back to this tomorrow. We'll finish putting all the, I'll put the Hebrew numbers in for everything. Go through, clean this up. Then we're going to start uh, this week trying to draw out these lines. Even before we make... Um, our present truth application. Yeah, just so a, a note. Yeah. Um, 2763. If you have like a zero between uh, the two and the seven, so if it's 20763, that would be 144 times 144. 
Yeah, it'd be the square of 144,000. Well, 144? Yeah, 144. But yeah, but the square root of that symbol for yes. the 100. Yeah, so 144 squared is 20763. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so we can attach that then as a symbol to the 144,000. Right. So the gods, people that are sealed. So I, I can put that footnote there right now. Even though, right. No. You no. Know what? That's not. 144 squared is 20736. Oh, yeah. I typed it backwards. OK, there we go. Yeah. So the other one is is different. So that's 763. Right. So we'll, OK, but we'll just put that in there. It's still got the same. Four digits. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study here um, this morning, and we ask for your angels' care and protection throughout this day. Please be with our loved ones and those we come in contact with. May we represent you aright. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.